Representative Lane from members of the Education Committee. I'd like to start by thanking you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Tim Godwin. I'm the Superintendent of Richland Public School District Number 44. I'm here to testify on behalf of my school district to the House Bill 1461. And I'd like to let you know that my district opposes House Bill 1461. I'm going to start by offering my support for our state superintendent. Um, you know that whoever that person may be, uh, their their goal is to support education, both state level and district level, to understand the national trends, to help guide our system. Um, we also have a democratic process. If that person doesn't follow through um, the requirements and duties of the job, that process will take care of. But to strip that person of their fiscal authority will do nothing but create a bottom for education. And as educators across the state will attest, and the ones here, there are enough bottlenecks in public education. House Bill 1461 also proposed to drop consular state standards and establish a committee to develop North Dakota specific content standards. I can understand the concerns of those who support this bill because they don't want more federal government control of what we teach our kids. I can say this though, uh, that that's kind of a fallacy. Common Core State Centers began in 2009 as a joint effort between National Government Association and the Council of State uh, Chief School Officers. So basically governors and state superintendents got together and they wanted to develop a set of standards that was consistent and that measured or, or guided our students to meet future outcomes to be career and, uh, and college ready. The goal was to help our children prepare for success in life, but not an orchestrated attempt of controlling what we are allowed to teach. At this time, there's 44 states in the District of Columbia that have adopted Common Core. And as an educator, I can see the benefits in that, you know, the benefits of a common framework. That means as students come into my school district, I know that the instruction they receive parallels the instruction we're administering at the time. Also, it's an ever-changing world out there. And this is no truer than the state of North Dakota. And over the last 20 years, we've seen a 14% increase in population across this state. Most of that was in the last three to five years or so. Now most of this population increase is the western part of the state, the oil fields, and the bigger cities. But also with this change in population come, comes a change in industry. So though we're mostly still agricultural based, this requires more complex skills. When you look at the oil industry and coal gasification, are on the rise. Um, I can speak directly for Richland School District by saying the drop in the common for state standards also, and taking time to rush through uh, the creation of a new set of standards, just kind of sets the table for disaster. First of all, they're still in their infancy. Um, the common core state standards were adopted by North Dakota in 2011, and full implementation wasn't until 2013. So they're still involved. But we have not had an opportunity to see the benefits or deficits in using these standards. And if we were to take the standards away, I can let you know also at Richmond School District, my patrons, my stakeholders, my teachers, uh, administration, students, took a lot of time to prepare. Took a lot of time to define these standards, to understand them, to start driving what we do all these standards. We purchased quantities of materials so that we could align with the standards and we knew that we were teaching what the standards were guiding us to teach. So if you take that away, it's creating such a fiscal burden on us, it might also create irreparable damage. One thing though 1461 does do is talk about uh, leaving common court consortium, or leaving a uh, smarter balance consortium, this is something I do think that we need to look at. Um, I can also support uh, other educators in the room across the state that when we did our first testing for smarter balance, it was a near disaster. Uh, not only the technological issues and the cost of upgrading our technology to meet those challenges, but simply the way that the, question, uh, the, the test asks questions itself. Uh, myself and my staff took the practice uh, tests just to see what our students would be subjected to. And I can now verify that I am not proficient in math at a fifth grade level. So I feel that my students at a fifth grade level may be challenged for something they don't necessarily uh, agree with. So I would propose that the committee adopt a, uh, a policy where they allow districts to 
report student performance in a way that's more commensurate with their stakeholders. It's more in line with the students in their district. Um, and some, some districts may choose to use standard aid testing, but I, I think you should leave that to those districts themselves. And I think with the commission, um, in, a, in a partnership with uh, North Dakota Department of Public Instruction and districts across the state can come up with uh, a group of assessments we can use. That's a very cool. I know for Richland School District, we use our Red South Star testing and our Ames Web testing. And those are tests that we use now, and we use them in the spring, we use them in the fall, and we use them to gauge what we're doing. We can monitor student progress along the way and make our own adjustments. So that, for us, for my district, is a true representation how our students are meeting the challenges for tomorrow. Um, in the packet that I've given you, I have actually a chart of population growth in North Dakota from 2001 through 2014. And also I have a, a printout of uh, our star reading, our Renaissance star reading. I just kind of show you an example of how we use that. Uh, it's a longitudinal graph. So we can use it to measure the student <coughs> progress over time throughout their schooling age. <coughs> see what we can do for this prepare them for the future. So, what I'm asking you to do, I guess, above and beyond everything else, is look out for our kids and support us as we're giving them the best possible education to prepare them for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Godfrey. Uh, right, we have some questions. Uh, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the assessments that you use to monitor student growth? Sure, well, let's talk about the amount of assessments that uh, we have to do now. Let's talk about those assessments that are required. They're phenomenal. I mean, we're assessing our students constantly. Look at 11th grade juniors. If I were a junior right now, I'd probably have a lot of sick days. Just so I can miss those tasks. Because we're giving them three, four tasks a year, and they're spending uh, an exorbitant amount of time preparing for them. Now, when we use our tests, we use formative assessment. And we use it in both performance way and some of ways. So we use assessments uh, like the STAR testing, which tests in reading and math. And, and we can even take those tests and break them down to see where students' uh, proficiency levels are, see where their strengths are, and see where their deficits are. And we can target that. And when we do our spring testing, that gives us an opportunity to follow through and see if that instruction um, was proficiency that helped them gain. Um, whereas if you look at a, a state test that's uh, administered once a year, for accountability measures that really doesn't tell us much about where our district <coughs> or student stands or how we can help them. Um, we also use the Ames Web Test, that's in elementary, we use that in elementary grades, and we test reading with that and math. And we use that to uh, screen students, we use that as a follow-up in the spring, but we also use the progress monitor students. So you talk about testing, when you talk about scenarios testing, we're doing that all along, and we use it proficiently in our school to monitor student progress and make program decisions. That is a true picture of Richland School District students. You said that uh, when you took the smart balance test that you were not proficient at the fifth grade level. Um, I know uh, you made that point to, to say, I guess, how, how poorly that, that test was, was maybe written, administered, techno technological issues, that kind of thing. But you know, doesn't that also speak to really the lack of usefulness of this of the situation here, here you are you know superintendent a, a doctoral student and you weren't proficient in math on the uh, smart balance test let's say they make improvements uh, to this test and let you, you retake it next year you're still not proficient uh, maybe you're proficient at the eighth grade level or the tenth grade level uh, but the point is it doesn't matter yeah, you it, it's not relevant to what you're doing right now and uh, I think that's the, the same case for some of our students. We hold them up to this, this standard in math or, or, or reading or, or whatever, and you know, if, if that skill is not relevant to their to their future educational endeavors, isn't it just isn't it just pointless? Because again, um, you know, whether whether you're proficient or not, I think that would have no bearing on your ability to be a successful superintendent. Thank you for that. Thank you for those comments, because here's the thing about Common Core, we need to separate Common Core, we need to separate testing from each other, because they're not. You know, the testing smart balance assessment is there to gauge or make adequate year of the progress. That has nothing to do with Common Core. The smart balance assessment was just one of the two 
major assessments out there that our state chose to use to measure student performance. It's not the only option out there. It's just one North Dakota chose. Um, Common Core guides us and gives us milestones along the way at each grade level that a student should, uh, knowledge a student should have, the knowledge a student should master. Um, and, and what that does is it guides us and gives us just a map. The testing itself, I absolutely agree. What use it is? Well, the, what the use is is that uh, I use that to show the state whether or not we're on level one, level two, level three in proficiency, whether we made AYP, whether we didn't make AYP. At my school, my district, we don't use that to determine how we're going to teach kids. Because we do that in the classroom. We do that through observations. We do that through our, our unit uh, testing. We do that through Ainsworth and Renaissance. We don't, we don't use uh, a, a national company, a commercial test. That doesn't give us any proof. So why not abandon the standards altogether then? If, uh, if you don't use you said you use uh, in the classroom, you use the student, you use those types of things, you use web. You know, why have uh, this, this, these national standards, period, or, or these common core standards, period? If you use all that other data to, to determine the success of your program and what you teach kids and how you teach kids, why not just focus on that and, and be done with the common core standards? Great, great question again. I guess that's where we get back to the misperception about mm -hmm. common core state standards. First of all, there's nothing national about it, unfortunately. <coughs> One of our uh, you know, the chief executive officer of our country gave us endorsement, but he didn't create it. The federal government had nothing to do with creation. I'm sure there was some influence in it. The federal government has uh, influence on just about everything we do, but it was states. You know, states got together and said, "What do our kids need to know to be successful?" Um, they took, I and mean, they didn't just get together. We're the governors and we're the superintendents, and we're going to figure this out. They solicited information from people, from business leaders. I mean, we're preparing our kids for the future. What is the future going to require? What are the demands? And that's what they looked at. What are the demands that our kids are going to be, uh, be put out there to be successful? The test has nothing to do with the standards. And if they got away with, or they got rid of um, smart balance assessment or park or whatever completely, it would still have no relevance in the use of the standards to guide us. And what are we teaching our kids? And what's the roadmap? What's the roadmap between kindergarten and 12th grade that we need to follow to help our kids meet the future demands of the labor, labor market and future demands of, of colleges? I mean, such a high percentage, and I apologize for not having the statistics, but such a high percentage of kids are going on, leaving high school and going to college and can't even take beginning college level math class or writing class or English class. Okay, so you're causing the family to spend more money. Um, you're, you're causing the students to spend time um, and a lot of effort to learn remedial skills just to begin at a freshman level. So they may have wasted a semester or a year. And whose fault is that? Well, you know, I, I can't point the finger at anybody, but somewhere along the line it was the system's fault because we didn't prepare them. Yeah, but you had made a comment about guidance and roadmap and those kind of things. Um, but the common, course, the common Core system has been in place for two or three years. Those students that are failing or are not able to compete in freshman level college or freshman level uh, college algebra, uh, they have been a product of the system of the Common Core for the past three or four years. So would it not make sense that as North Dakotans we make our own roadmap, we make our own guide, and to see if that would be more successful rather than this generated program through that has been endorsed by the federal government. And I guess that's a great perception as well. Um, Common Core came about because those students were going in college level courses and weren't uh, had the skills to compete at the college level. Uh, that's what led to Common Core being built, things like that. So it, it isn't just in the past two or three years that our students haven't you know, been able to uh, uh, enter a college level algebra class or college level math or writing or reading class. That's not just over the last two or three years. That's over the last one, two decades. And that's what that's where we came to this point where we said, well we need we need a very uh, a structured way of knowing our kids are receiving you know this knowledge. Um, and the consistency part of it, you know, and I'm gonna 
I'm going to detract from the school district. I've been in districts where the transient rate is amazing, where you have 50% of your kids coming into and leaving your district on a yearly basis. Um, so when they come into your district and they haven't had a parallel uh, uh, a map of what they're learning, you start from scratch mid-year. I've had them come into my school third quarter, and I can't start from scratch. You know, the consistency in those standards across the states or across whatever states are currently adopting it, I know they should be here at this time. I know they should have learned this material. They should have this prerequisite knowledge. And I can set them off with the rest of the class. So let's get back to the kids. When we look at kids, where is the service or disservice at? Um, we need to look what's right for North Dakota. We also need to look what's right for our kids. Okay. Right, thank you, Mr. Godfrey. That, that, um, I think we'll take that as the line. We've got a lot of people lined up ready to come in here today. Okay. But I'd like to thank you very much for your very full answer and responses. And I, I, on behalf of committee members, you gave some very good responses to that and, and really answered a lot of questions for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right,